Welcome to our webinar, Combining IoT and Augmented Reality for Business Continuity and Transformation. I'm Abby Lundberg. I'm a business technology researcher and writer and president of Lundberg Media, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. This webinar will be recorded and available to all of you within three to four business days. We welcome your questions for our speakers today. You can enter them anytime in the questions module on the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMREvent. We'll answer as many questions as possible after the presentation and before we wrap up at 1230. You can also use the questions module to get help if you have any trouble with the audio or other technical issues. Today's topic is quite timely. Augmented reality and the Internet of Things have been proving their value during this time of disruption. And it's increasingly clear that the two technologies really draw power from each other. While IoT generates data and insight, AR contextualizes that data so frontline workers can make good use of it in the real world. In fact, more than 80% of companies that are using IoT also use or are considering using AR to optimize their operations and financial returns. This is according to a new survey of more than 200 executives conducted by BCG and PTC. The research indicates that IoT AR adoption will accelerate. Any company whose decision-making employees engage with physical objects or spaces should explore an AR IoT strategy now or risk being left behind. We're really fortunate to have two very smart people share their insights with us today. Uh, in this space, they, they uh, really at the leading edge and they were very involved in that research that I just mentioned. Vladimir Lukic is Managing Director and Partner at Boston Consulting Group, a member of BCG's Industrial Goods, Operations and People and Organization Practices. He actively helps shape client agendas in a number of key areas. These include advanced analytics, IoT, and digital. Vlad is a co-leader of BCG's digital agenda and has helped found and grow the firm's advanced analytics and geo-analytics capabilities. Our second speaker is Craig Melrose, Executive Vice President of Digital Transformation Solutions at PTC. Craig was appointed to lead this newly formed organization in June 2019. The group builds customer-facing solutions that incorporate PTC's CAD, PLM, IoT, and AR technologies. Craig came to PTC after 20 years as a principal and partner at McKinsey, where he led the manufacturing area in collaboration with the firm's operations practice. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Abby. Uh, so I'll kick us off. This is Vlad Lukic, so you can connect the voice. Uh, really pleasure to connect with you all and share some of our um, findings in the space and share our excitement and, and enthusiasm. Not to belabor a lot on the introduction uh, that Abby nicely put in play. Um, I, I've been with BCG for 15 years and ever since I joined from MIT, I've been living in the intersection of the various uh, technical fields, uh, which naturally led me to IoT. So as part of that, um, I help our clients take on broad digital transformations, build their capabilities and articulate both roadmaps and then execute on them as they transform their companies with all the new technologies and the data. Uh, and in addition to that, um, I help, I try to stay cutting edge and at, at, the, at the front of the things that are coming. And I would very much put the AR um, into that bucket. It is technology that is happening. We are at the beginning of uh, a very, very interesting and exciting um, revolution in front of us. So excited to share our perspectives on it. Greg? Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Vlad. As Vlad was mentioning and, and Abby introduced me, well, just a couple of extra points. Craig Melrose here and everyone in the audience today can just think of me as a 25 plus year transformation operational improvement person, formerly with Toyota, then with McKinsey for a long time, and now with PTC. And I think the excitement of what you'll hear Vlad and I share today, all transformations need additional elements to get even more value and impact out of them. Uh, Vlad has learned that over, over his career. I've learned that over mine. And, and what we'll share today is the additional power in transformation today is around leveraging IoT and AR. 
and the companies that are doing that most successfully are the furthest along in getting the most value and impact. So to start our discussion today, I'll just share and set a little bit of context. Disruption is happening and there are major lessons to be learned. We'll share three of those today. Over three, four, 75%, however you want to think about it, businesses are attempting to implement some type of digital transformation. Um, this is only being accelerated due to COVID crisis, tra travel bans, working from home, et cetera. And these policies may also become the new norm. Companies are deciding, do we actually need offices? Do we need as many offices? Do we have a different split of work from home and work from office than we've had in the past? So this is certainly happening to all of us real time today, which is accelerating the need to think about how we operate differently. Similarly, in the middle of the page, you see digital transformations being accelerated, not just for desk workers, obviously a massive increase in Zoom and Teams and Skype and these types of tools, but also even frontline workers um, beyond just the knowledge workers or desk workers. Frontline workers are leveraging remote technologies such as uh, augmented reality, uh, PTC's offering of Euphoria Chalk. Um, Euphoria Chalk just this year has had a 10x increase in consumption and usage. There are other on, uh, online tools that PTC offers such as Onshape from a CAD platform standpoint. We've seen similar increases there. So certainly a need and a requirement being asked of many um, individuals in their work environment and their new norm to leverage remote access. And you see cloud and SaaS are absolutely dominating that because that is the ability to either connect with pieces of equipment in the field remotely or connect people one to the another remotely and being able to leverage that data remotely. So you have this ability to remote access that you see here in the middle. And then lastly, this new norm, what will it look like? Vlad and I have no market uh, or corner on the market on what the new norm will look like, but certainly here you see organizations, third parties like Gartner, interviewing over 300 chief financial officers, and a majority of those are saying that they are going to look at remote being permanent in some way, shape, or form, which gets back to to the first column, the new norm is showing us that this is possible. And many leaders and many companies are saying, we're going to adopt this going forward, partly because we're just as productive as we've always been, partly from potentially cost cutting and um, morale, other items and aspects. And then you see here, even uh, Twitter is saying people can work from home permanently, at least through the end of the year, potentially even beyond the end of the year. So. Everyone is looking at the current situation and leveraging remote access and saying, this is a new norm. So Vlad, I know from the article that, that was written, there's lots and lots of data out there around how IoT and AR are being leveraged. Would you care to share with us all some of those findings? Yes, happy to. Um, so as a little bit of additional backdrop, uh, backdrop to what Craig just put in play, we all know that IoT is out there and the data keeps growing. I remember the good old times when gigabyte was a lot and now we're in zettabytes. Uh, but what that has resulted in is that there's much more data being generated, but data is stuck. Even when you migrate it into data lakes, uh, just the long processing times and latency before you can do something with it are hindering ability in the field to do something with it. Second, the data sources are still fairly disjointed. The protocols are always different. Um, and what it results in is that limited information is at the fingertips of the operators in the field, right? And the operator can be a doctor in the OR. It could be a person uh, moving parcels and loading up a truck and anything in between, right? A farmer in the field. Um, so the data is not coming to them. It's not at their fingertips. Now, AR is potentially that unlock that can put the technology um, into action and liberate that, that data and put it at the right time to the right person in the field. Uh, with all this as the backdrop, last year, probably mid-year, 
uh, we at BCG got together and said, let's let's just get a sense for what's really happening out there, right? Are the companies deploying IoT broadly defined? And when they do that, do they deploy AR as part of it, or is it still an elusive technology down the you know to come down the line? And the findings were actually pretty surprising. So the the response rate was over a thousand individuals across 300 companies. Uh, of which qualified when we cleaned it up was around 900. But what we found was that over 80% of the companies that deploy IoT are deploying AR in parallel. And within that, what we found is that 30% of that is actually implementing solutions in the field and 70% is in the early stages of exploring and piloting. So the first surprise was that how much the companies are seeing linkage directly between data generation and then projecting it into the field. The second surprise was that it's still somewhat in the early stages of exploring and piloting and experimenting. Uh, when we look at, uh, this is a data rich page, uh, but there are a few interesting things that when we unpack the data uh, that came out. First one is that over 80% of the companies uh, are actually doing something with IoT and, and, and augmented reality. Uh, what you see in the first graph is that the spike, right, of the companies that are experimenting has happened over the last three years. From 2016, we started to see an uptick, 17, 18. Um, again, the survey was done in 2019, so the number was, um, was low there, but this is to reflect when did they really start working with IoT and, and AR. So it's a fairly recent phenomenon. Now, the second thing is uh, when we ask them about when do they expect the first IoT AR solutions to be fully functional, what you see in the middle is there's probably 25, 30% of them that are saying we already have them fully functional, but majority of them are still expecting that from 2020 onwards is where they're going to see the biggest unlock. And when we ask them, when do you think that um, IoT AR applications are going to become table, stake, table stakes in your industry. They're in this two to five year time horizon. The ones that are more aggressive uh, are saying within two years. Um, the ones that are ex in early experimentation phases are saying it's in the three to five year range, um, which is a good signal that they are uh, they're experimenting. And what you heard from Craig, they're seeing actually within PTC an uptick in the sales, right, of their AR solutions, which is very interesting to now compare with uh, more of the research-like data that, um, that you're seeing on these charts. So it's happening uh, and it's coming pretty fast at us and over the next two to five years, we should see some pretty interesting deployments. Now, when we looked further to understand what are really the sweet spot areas, right, for IoT with, with AR, there were five attributes that popped out when we looked at a broad set of use cases out there. One is, first attribute is that there needs to be some connection between digital and physical, right? So it's not a fully automated, automatable piece of work or a task. There needs to be a linkage where um, the execution will happen in a physical way, but having a piece of info or digital interaction would be helpful to make it more effective. Second, uh, the actions need to be human driven. Right? So we need a human in the equation that is actually um, executing a specific task. Uh, third one is uh, data aggregation is complex. It's not just a simple phone call uh, or a simple um, display of one data, um, data point, but actually there are different data sources that need to be amalgamated and somehow uh, delivered at the moment when they're needed, uh, which leads to the fourth attribute. All the applications are somehow, they, they are in the moment and they need to be real time right? You're making an action in a few seconds. Uh, you need a piece of information in front of you at that moment. Uh, and then the last one is there are hidden layers in the equation. So think about probably all of us have at some point had to go to the instructions on the printer uh, and replace a cartridge or a piece of it and the little projections that were happening on it that were super annoying. Think about there are a lot of hidden layers when we're interacting with objects um, and augmented reality brings a unique ability to help you see beyond uh, just what the eye sees uh, at the front face. So those are the five attributes. Now, how does that translate into specific use cases and, and what we're seeing out there? So we've, as part of the survey, I think we've shared over hundred different use cases to the, to the respondents. And there were 33 that came to the top prevalently mentioned by all of them. And so when we looked at them, we tried to organize and see 
try to make sense out of all of them. And there are two dimensions that I would like you to, to keep an eye on as, as we think about the use cases of the uh, IoT and AR. First one is the types of applications, which is what you see in the first column from top to bottom. So there are three. One is they enhance a human capability. The second one is they can be used to manage space. The third one is they can manage equipment or objects and we'll bring them to life through specific use cases. And then the second dimension is uh, what is it used for? And there are three broad buckets. First one is just to visualize the data and interact with the environment. The second one is to actually diagnose a problem, right? And give you some piece of information. And the third one is to give you information real time to actually take some action, right? So as we think, as we try to combine them, right? When you think about enhancing human capabilities and just using the visualization of the data, which is the, the where 13% of the use cases are, think about trainings, the pilot trainings, the military trainings, the training of the healthcare professionals, training of uh, factory workers who are put on the shop floor and before they actually go and interact with the equipment, they actually get to immerse themselves um, into the flow uh, of the production. And then take that enhanced human capability application and go to the last column, which is to take an action. Uh, it is healthcare worker. It is um, potentially someone uh, you know, doing an operation, getting instructions real time. It is uh, a worker in the factory that is getting instructions uh, to actually move an object uh, or do something as they're doing an assembly. Now, when we think about managing spaces, uh, we're all watching the, the, the fun shows online about uh, space, you know, decorations of the homes and shuffling the spaces. A lot of the visualizations in this space are about um, simulating and showing how things could look in a different way, right? It gets into the design um, and uh, optimizing either the warehouses or the stores and now getting even into the cities. All right. And when we think about last row here, which is managing equipment or objects, the most frequent ones are in the last two columns around either diagnosing problems. So think about um, either a factory worker or a maintenance person uh, out in the field who are getting real time alerts about going to go and check a specific piece of equipment. And then in the last column, getting real time instructions uh, on actually doing something with that equipment in a different way, right? Replacing a part. Uh, or adjusting or, or changing the settings. And so this gives you a little bit of a landscape of where we are seeing a number of use cases. What we were gonna do next is Craig is gonna try to bring them to life through some very specific applications that PTC has been seeing and where they've been deploying their solutions. Perfect, thank you, Vlad. As Vlad was saying, everyone heard, lots of organizations are at a different starting point on adopting IoT and AR. And so what we want to do, knowing that everyone on this webinar is potentially at a different point, either deep into AR and expanding that use, uh, the use cases, uh, many of which are shown here, or even just at the beginning of applying IoT and AR within their, their digital transformation, we wanted to bring to bear three specific examples that address about 50% of everything that was identified here on this page and in the article. Those three, the intersections of human capability and visualizing the data, managing spaces, as well as visualizing the data and interacting with the, with the environment there. And then last but not least, diagnosing problems on equipment and or objects. So we'll dive into each of those. The first is a company called Varian. As you can see here, Varian has um, medical devices that they're manufacturing. Those medical devices, in the field need to have a high availability here labeled as clinical availability or uptime so think of it as an asset needing to perform ideally 24 7 or whatever the application is and in this example what you're seeing service technicians are able to engage with that piece of equipment understand its performance what challenges it's had what's working well, what's not working well from an IoT standpoint, take that IoT data, translate it into an AR experience that then walks the technician through what is the activity, what are the steps, what are the parts, 
that I need to replace, potentially even need to order real time once I see that I need that part, any and all activity around fixing that issue on that machine at that point in time in order to increase that availability. So what you're seeing is improved fixed first time right rates. You're seeing increased availability for the asset and you're allowing more people to actually do the maintenance work or the technician work. So simple maintenance could be outsourced to somebody that is present with the equipment and more complex is still somebody that's a specialized resource or a specialized um, individual, specialized set of skills. So here you could imagine in a clinical setting, healthcare, med device, absolutely critical due to patient care, et cetera, and leveraging both IoT and AR to increase the availability of that asset. We'll switch gears now. And what I hope you're seeing is from med device to airlines and airline maintenance, IoT and AR can be applied in any industry, anywhere, anytime. And so this is truly technology that is the great equalizer. Large companies, small companies, any company in any industry can leverage the technology to have a higher level of performance. And so here you're seeing aircraft maintenance, uh, engine maintenance, and what you're doing is seeing the shop floor is connected and you understand what the shop floor is doing, when it is doing it, and so you're improving the quality of the work and of the, the functioning asset, but you're also being able to accelerate the speed of maintenance, a bit like the previous example, first time right, even minimizing time between failures because it's a higher quality repair, higher quality maintenance. And in an overhaul setting where jet engines cost tens of millions of dollars, airline uptime is absolutely critical, turning the assets around and making sure that they're full of, of individuals, except right now when we're, we're all working from home. But normally for an airline, this is absolutely critical. And this is worth tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of being able to turn the assets around quickly, getting the work done right the first time, absolutely even monitoring and measuring the work to understand what was done, how do I capture that, and even have the um, track and trace capability of what activity occurred on that asset at that point in time, and even being able to share and capture best practices for other activities that are similar, but on a different engine or a different asset at a different point in time. So again, Showing an example here on over uh, airline overhaul and airline maintenance on, on jet aircraft engines. And then last but not least, looking at managing equipment, managing production lines in a factory setting. So the first two examples that I just shared were connected products in the field and maintaining those and increasing the uptime. Here, think of it as connected assets in a factory making products. And so in this example, Pactive is a company that makes packaging material for consumer packaged goods. Here you see food applications, drink applications. And in making that material, just like any factory, there's always going to be operating issues. The assets that are making the material could be starved of um, materials that are being made into that packaging application. So here you're seeing at the front end, there's a blending piece to create the right characteristics and, and the right materials. That blended material then goes into being formed into the containers that you're seeing here on the screen. And so either in that blending application or even in that manufacturing and forming application, material could be missing. You could have similar issues with downtime, but here in a factory setting, the downtime may not just be maintenance. It could be speed losses, it could be quality losses, it could be operator issues like the equipment is jamming or a piece of material is not advancing on a conveyor belt, all of which is being monitored again through IoT and so you have this access to the data and the information to then turn around and have an AR experience that says, what do I need to do when this presents itself in order to stop it from happening and or fix it and get it back to the right operating level. Similar to the previous examples here, you're seeing Pactive saving double digit improvements, even upwards of 50% in anybody's company, in any organization, in any factory or on any product 
if you had 10 to 50% increased availability, increased uptime, that absolutely is game changing on your performance and on your cost structure. And then your resources, your people, your labor, your technicians that are engaging with the data and engaging with the AR experience are actually having a more productive day because they understand being guided with the right content in the right context, knowing exactly what to do to get it done right the first time. And so I just wanna reemphasize against these three examples, having the right content is absolutely critical and hopefully everyone here understands and sees IoT and AR is providing the right content. But AR further provides that content in exactly the right context. You're viewing the world in front of you, the equipment in front of you, whether it's in a factory or whether it's in the field, whether it's a service issue or whether it's a different operating issue. And in that exact context, you're applying that content. And that is the power of unlocking IoT and AR because anyone can see exactly in their environment and then it's decorated with the content. Where do I need to reach next? What action do I need to take next? How do I need to, to change this environment so that I can see these types of items being repaired, fixed, um, and improved? So those are a few examples that are leading to that double digit impact that I described. So Vlad, do you wanna share with us how companies are actually benefiting and the ones that are furthest ahead on IoT and AR application, what type of improvement they're seeing? Yes, uh, thank you, Craig. And it, it's super exciting because the benefits are real, right? Um, and so what you see on this page is a summarized high level, but um, it, it's real and it's happening. So first one is we're seeing things like increase in service revenues to the degree of 10 to 20%. Uh, we're also seeing the improvement in the first time fix rates um, in the field by 30 to 50%. So to, to bring those two together, imagine a company that provides maintenance services for uh, HVACs or potentially for elevators. And if they can now through the deployment of AR, uh, make sure that their first time fix rates are 30 to 50% higher, right and they they are much more faster in resolving the issues the clever companies are using that as an input into their negotiations so when they're negotiating a contract they're much more aggressive in putting the fees at risk uh, or guaranteeing much higher service level standards um, and it results then in a higher conversion of new contracts so one of the pitfalls that we see when companies don't do that is they focus on IoT AR when they evaluate the use cases just on is it is it just reducing the costs or is it just speeding up and they don't link it into the actual sales process. The companies that manage to do that get double benefit, right? They are faster, they're more effective, uh, they're cheaper uh, in terms of their cost structure and it also allows them to win much more business. So those are significant numbers um, and they're pretty large. What you see on the right hand side of this page is there are significant additional costs that get reduced when this is deployed well, right? One is just the training costs. We were just working with one company um, over the last three months. They make their they are seat car seat manufacturer, and we managed to get their training uh, from 40 days down to 10 days for the new employees that go on the shop floor. That is a dramatic saving, and we did it by just deploying uh, clever, clever AR. Uh, applications uh, during their onboarding process. And then the last one that you see on this page is overall the decreased labor from faster operations, right? So a number of examples of this are happening now in the e-commerce space. You can think about mail or parcel carriers that need to sort out, um, sort out their boxes uh, before they go out uh, on a route delivery. So instead of waiting to get on the route and then trying to find the box that goes into your house, uh, with clever um, AR deployed to instruct them how to organize the boxes in their trucks, et cetera, they can shave off hours um, out of their prep time and therefore overall they can handle much more volume. So those are real benefits. And what you also see in the middle is that there is a huge improvement in overall health and safety of the employees, right? Both in how it plays out is uh, a lot of the new employees before getting in, in the new environments on the shop floor or into the operations, 
um, can get exposure to them through the through the augmented reality before going there. And then second, once they are on those shop floors, if they're facing um, an, an structurally unsafe situation, they could be getting alerts real time, they could be getting real time instructions to avoid them. Um, and so even if we put all the dollars aside, the, the price on the on the human safety um, uh, is is tremendous. And, and AR is, is increasingly seen as uh, one of the key levers to to ensure that that happens. So those are some of the reflections on the benefits. Now, how to get it moving, right, and how to get it right. These are a few high-level uh, reflections. I'll put them in play, and then both Craig and I will reflect on them. The first one is you need to think both about the scope and the value. Number one is you need to make sure that the projects that you prioritize, there should be a handful of them, and there should be a clear line of sight to value creation. So you can both generate enthusiasm and get it moving. Where a lot of companies fail is they try to now go for the full end-to-end -end play. They try to now overhaul their infrastructure, and suddenly something that should be a few million dollar effort becomes hundreds of millions and it just stops. So figure out a few very specific use cases that you can go after and generate uh, some of the value up front. And make sure that both AR and IoT are seen together in the initial setups of the projects versus AR being an afterthought that comes later, uh, which makes it much harder to execute on it. The second one is you must think about the organizational structure and making sure that the different silos are talking. In a number of examples that I shared, uh, you can imagine how much HR team got involved uh, to make sure that standard operating procedures are followed. Um, you, you can imagine that in the example that I shared um, to generate new revenues, you must work with a commercial organization as well. So they're aware of what can be done. And only if you do that cross-functional collaboration in the right way, can you unlock the value from the from the AR and IoT together. And then the last one is in, in terms of thinking about development and the launch, uh, one user experience must be at the center of it. Uh, imagine just holding a device that is constantly projecting something at you eight hours a day. Ergonomically, that's something that is really not effective, right? So you really need to think through what is the right application? How will I make it both user, user friendly and user centric? Um, and then the second point there is uh, you should build these solutions around a range of different devices. It, will it should never be one AR device. Uh, you should count that people are using their watches, their phones, their tablets, projectors, uh, and now all of the VR devices as well. So as you're thinking through solutions, you must be different devices and forms. Craig, any other reflections from your end? Just let me overlay, Vlad, a, um, a real use or a real example of what we've seen with our customers deploying from the first column like we just shared on the, the use cases and the case studies imagine you're spending a hundred million dollars a year on maintenance if you could save 10 percent of that double digit there's 10 million dollars i don't know how many organizations have 10 million dollar uh projects that they're going after and again this is a hypothetical situation using the math but that is what you should be aspiring to and if not rank the projects differently and because that's the level of impact that you should be seeing if you can get 10 million improvement in maintenance costs that's also going to lead to higher uptime for the operating so from a cross-functional standpoint applying iot and ar together standpoint operations is going to benefit maintenance is going to benefit all of that then is going to allow inventory changes so the supply chain is going to potentially benefit certainly the customer is going to benefit with items being shipped on time, being able to potentially increase sales. So you see the cross-functional nature, all of those individuals being involved is going to guarantee that the project gets done, gets done correctly and gets done quickly. So I think that's that application and, and bringing to life that center column. And then the last piece, don't wait to get started, right? Everyone doesn't have to be utilizing a wearable device. It, it can be any screen in any environment as long as it has the right content and the right context. That's the key. What is it that I need to do? Where do I need to do it? How do I need to do it? And unlocking that in order to get back to that first column to get that double digit impact is hopefully what everyone's hearing today from Vlad and myself. So maybe 
we'll switch into giving everyone just a quick one minute video. There's some music in the background of the video. Uh, and then after the video, I will come back and we'll switch into Q and A. But in the video, hopefully it helps to bring to life a little bit of what Vlad and I've been sharing over the last uh, 30, 40 minutes so that everyone can further reinforce how they're thinking about and how they need to think about achieving that double digit impact by unlocking IoT and AR. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, really interesting research that you've been working on and, and a great presentation. Um, I was really struck by, um, I love the, the use case, the way you've laid out the use cases. That grid I find really helpful, um, both in terms of thinking about how to sort of um, categorize these different use cases, but also really interesting to see where things are really heading now. Um, so we have some great questions coming in. Um, before we get to the audience questions, I just have one question I, I'm curious about. Was there anything that came out of the research that surprised either of you? Um, you know, this is this is pretty cutting edge. We had a lot of uh, very senior people. Was there anything that surprised you? For for me, the biggest surprise was just the volume of activity because I, I was reflecting on what was happening in the field. And my guess of how many companies were doing something, even in the experimentation phase, was that it's going to be maybe 20 to 30 percent of them, right? And when we actually did the research, we found out that, you know, more than 80 percent of them are actually doing something, uh, which was just fascinating. And they're also not seeing this as a shiny object for 10 years out, uh, but they're actually deeply involved now. They're thinking through it and they're spending money on it. So I think that was the biggest just the, the, the scale and the proliferation of the uh, experimentation and activity was, was the biggest surprise. Yeah, I, I thought that was interesting. Um, actually, let's go ahead and turn on our webcams. And Craig, was there anything that surprised you? I would only add, Abby, that the number of companies that are actually getting to scale and actually beyond piloting, right? So certainly there's lots of experimentation, but there are a lot of companies that are actually seeing the value and saying we need to go larger with this, faster with this, so that we can get that savings across a larger portion of the company, a larger portion of the cost base. Right. Um, so to, to your point about you know, not trying to do this in a massive enterprise-wide kind of initiative, one of the questions from the audience is, um, is there, are there prerequisites or is there a checklist for a company that's trying to adopt this in a significant way? And, and the question was really about company culture. Um, is, is there, you have to make sure that the company culture is ready for this and, and how, do you, how do you go about sort of helping that along? Sure, sure, I'm happy to, to take a stab at that one, Abby, and certainly Vlad, if you have more to add. What I would say is, even at PTC, we're changing the language from proof of concept to proof of value, right? Everyone knows the technology works. It's more about using the technology on the exact right item and use case to get the most value. A few times in the presentation today, we mentioned prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. What's the rank order of the value to be unlocked? If you can find double digit impact across a huge portion of your cost, which then leads to double digit millions, the entire organization is going to rally behind making it successful, giving the right resources, the right leadership support to remove any barriers or roadblocks, and then being able to actually scale the technology so that it's not isolated on a single line or a single asset or a single experiment in the field. 
So I think it's critical to truly prove the value and make sure that all the resources required are involved from the beginning, leadership all the way to the, to the shop floor and then back to the top floor because it's going to work. And when it works, you're gonna to wanna to move quickly. And if they're not involved from the beginning, you're gonna to have to then turn around and repeat that again and have everyone involved. And that's just slowing down the ability to accelerate and, and get to scale. Any other thoughts, Vlad? Yeah, I would just build off of that and say, the it's not just about get started and do two, three things and see how it goes and hopefully it snowballs, right? I think upfront, you need to set the level of ambition. If you say, we're just gonna be exploring a little bit with AR, what you're gonna do is you're gonna buy five, six licenses, we're gonna put them in the field and it might or might not snowball into something. But if you say, listen, we're gonna drive billion dollars of top line and billion dollars of the bottom line by integrating our data from the sensors into the operations and convert it into the projects, right? And how we sell, suddenly the level of ambition is different and it forces the right conversations in the organization, right? Um, and when you do it that way, we've also moved away from the digital type of language. We're moving into the bionic type of language. So you don't need just the digital infrastructure. You need human and processes uh, and different functions to actually work together, right? And so you got to think about it end to end, set the ambitions at that level, and then work away from that ambition into the specific use cases, as Craig said, that you can point to value and then you snowball the, the, the actual deployment through that. I was really interested in your benefit slide, and and it's really great to see the benefits are coming in so many different uh, forms, and and both in top line and bottom line kinds of uh, values. One of the questions that we got from the audience was, and this was a question that they're hearing from boards and executives: Is it ethical to pursue the transformation agenda around? So so we know that it's going to help save costs. Is it ethical to pursue the transformation agenda when faced with the human COVID-19 pandemic that's threatening job security and possibly compounding it by accelerating digitization? Um, or I guess I guess the, 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 another way to phrase that is, um, can you use the insights that, that you're learning from the use cases to sort of solve that paradox? You know, we want to be more efficient. We want to make work better, but Right now, when so many jobs are being lost, how do you how do you sort of manage that piece of it? I I, I love the question. It's it's uh, I I truly love it. it. It is it goes much more broader than you know can we deploy this technology or not? And I'm trying to do the parallel in my own life. If I could free up two hours of my day or four hours in my day by deploying some technology and making it more efficient, I would do it in a heartbeat. The question then is, what do I do with that extra? hours right and how do i deploy them and I, am i deploying them for the right thing so i think the question should be then towards the companies that deploy this and free up those resources right and and time of their employees how are they then redeploying it a lot of my companies have struggled with the question to say well listen we're not in the cost cutting space um then then i give them examples of amazons of the world that are deploying technology right aggressively but they just keep adding tens of thousands of employees on a monthly basis. It's actually, I'm more productive, I'm more efficient, I'm winning more in the marketplace, allows me to grow, uh, and it gives me that flexibility to win, right? And so there is a, that angle to think about it as well. I don't know, Craig, your questions. I fully agree, Vlad. I, I think historically we've always seen whatever the new disruptive change is, it certainly impacts existing jobs, but then an entire new marketplace is made that adds jobs that didn't exist. And so what I think you're seeing here is similar, being able to get to full scale inside of an enterprise actually is gonna create jobs that may not exist today that are different, either from being able to operate differently, from a different focus. And so it, it does more move into training or does more move into, um, adding volume or changing shift structures, which is actually giving back to the workforce where there's less overtime because I'm more productive. Not that you want less overtime because certainly there's a compensation standpoint, but it's more about a life balance standpoint where if I can achieve today's volume in standard hours rather than additional overtime hours, it gives me cost flexibility on my product. It gives me uh, morale benefits from a, from a labor standpoint. 
So I think it's it's looking at the big picture and not just looking at it saying everything's going to stay the same as it is in today's paradigm, just with less. Yeah. Many more things are going to change, and you have to react to that and, and fill that void once that change occurs. Thank it you. And like I know there was a, go one ahead. More, like the ethics as the question is one of the big ones right around the technology, right? Some of the use cases of AR we're seeing from China is the police officers projecting temperatures of the individuals passing by them, right? And then immediately putting them aside. Like, is that ethical or not? Like, those are the big questions that we all, that this technology is going to force, right? And it's just going to be fascinating to see how that evolves in the coming years. Great, and, and thank you for embracing that, you know, was, that was kind of a hardball question, <laughs> getting right into the meat of it. Um, so a, a couple more practical kinds of questions. Um, so one, one's around cost. So how, what, what, what should people be expecting in terms of the cost of migration? And, and what are some of the key points they need to consider as they, as they, before they migrate? Sure. Um, certainly there's a cost. What I would say is AR is an extremely approachable cost point, price point. The challenge is what's the underlying infrastructure around being connected, being able to get access to the data. So even companies that have assets from the mid 1900s that are not smart or connected, they are leveraging AR, but they're limited on the amount of data that they can ingest to leverage AR. So it's more of an experience where I captured what to do and I can replay that back to someone that doesn't have that level of expertise. The more connected the products or the factories and the, the products in the field, the more data available to then enhance that AR experience and be able to provide um, even more instruction in context to handle a larger set of use cases. So I think the challenge is more the underlying infrastructure than it is applying the actual IoT and, and AR technology. But what, what are your thoughts, Juan? Yeah, I would say that that ends up being the biggest challenge. What we've seen is dramatic drop in prices, right? So I was just with a, with a steel manufacturer a couple months ago where they wanted to put some sensors on the on their grinders and add AR as part of the solution. And three years ago, it was $50,000 to put those sensors and several months of deployment per machine. Uh, when we did it now, it was $100 per machine. Right and half a day of deployment. So the the prices have changed dramatically. Uh, it is really hard to put a number and say this is what it should be because it's directly driven by that level of ambition that I mentioned. Right, if you're going to be going into integrating this into your sales offer, etc., uh, there is a cost that's related also to change management, changing the processes, which is not something that you pay for technology, but for the integration and for the all the coordination efforts that go. Um, the actual software to do the AR bit of it is super accessible and we're talking in thousands of dollars, right, to actually get licenses and to deploy. The hidden costs are around the infrastructure, the development around it, etc. So the bolder the ambition, the simpler it is to make the case uh, versus just experimentation. So once the, once the, you know, making sure the infrastructure is in place, but then from there doing that prioritization that you talked about and where are we going to get the most value and, and what's that going to cost us? So um, from, a, from another practical perspective, you've seen a lot of these deployments roll out. You've seen what people are doing. What are some of the most common mistakes that people make um, and, and how can they avoid them? Yeah, go for it, Craig, or you want me to? I, so I'll start and then you, you can follow. You don't so, have to name names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so one is that, like, one typical one is that ambition is too small. So they, it just becomes an interesting gadgety thing in the corner that a cool techie is doing, right? And it's never linked into the big story. And it therefore can never snowball. Never, You never give it enough oxygen to, to snowball into something bigger. So... Uh, it is important to, to set it up within the broader context uh, would be one. Second is um, that it is tech driven, not business outcomes driven. W what I mean by that is you develop a cool solution, but you don't really think about how do we engage HR to change the underlying standard operating procedure for this operator? How do we make sure that we get 
uh, you know, visibility to the full shop floor that there is some change going on? How do we train the operators? So if it's tech driven, right, none of those things are thought through until you have something and suddenly you just get complaints to the HR that you're violating the economics rules because something is being projected in your line of sight. Uh, and therefore, let's stop this silliness, right? But if that's all thought through up front, it allows you to actually snowball it. So those are typically pitfalls that, uh, you know, prevent things from happening at scale and in a meaningful way. I could not agree more. One additional item just to add to what Vlad said. Imagine a factory has 100 pieces of equipment in it, just for simple math. 10 of those 100 are probably constrained assets, bottlenecks, critical path, elements that are limiting the factory. If you're applying the solution to one of the 90, you're not going to see any value. And so you actually have to really understand what is the right use case, what is the right application, but most importantly, where. If it's a critical constrained asset, bottleneck, critical path, you're actually going to change the way you operate, which gives you degrees of freedom to monetize it in a whole host of ways. If you're not, you're only making a relative improvement on something that doesn't really matter, and you're not going to see a change to the underlying performance, and so you're not going to see a return on the, the uh, investment or even impact that can be measured from a change in the uh, the way you're operating. And so in addition to the, the culture change and mindset change that Vlad was mentioning and the prioritization, there's also a understanding of what matters most and not de-risking so much that you're working on something that doesn't matter, but instead you're working on, on something that is critical path and, and um, required ch to change in order to see the benefit. Uh, sort of a follow on to that, um, as you're rolling these things out and, and planning for the, you know, the, the, the change management and the communication and making sure that all the different pieces are together. The question is, what kind of skill sets should a functional team have for this not the it team but the functional team before they're able to you're able to roll this out no new skill required <laughs> it is it's the same operations with the same products and the same people but with additional technology so if i have assets in the field you know, I, I'm a manufacturer that makes pumps and my pumps are in different factories all over the world. I still need to make sure that those pumps are operating correctly. And whoever my customer is needs to make sure that that pump inside of all of the other equipment that they're using is operating effectively. Being able to measure the performance of that leveraging IT only gives me better data. Today, it might be on a whiteboard or paper-based, but now it's virtual and it's digitized and just better information faster. In addition to that, I've always had to perform the maintenance. When I perform the maintenance, it's been skill-based, training-based, even paper-based from looking into a binder and opening up a playbook or a manual to understand what I need to do. Now it's digitized. Now it's virtual. I can just call it down from a library, put it onto my screen, use it in the field, in the context where it's actually showing me on this pump, here's the item that needs to be unscrewed, this needs to be removed. Once this is removed, perform these three steps. Put it back in this order torque the screws in this order it's just fully integrated walking me through where i don't even need to know and have decades of experience or knowledge it actually can be downloaded to me to make me as productive as somebody that's been doing it for 30 or 40 years but it's still the same activity so what i would say is um, from an operation standpoint from a from a functional standpoint what is it you need to do and then helping having someone with you that cross-functional team say now how can i leverage technology to execute what it is that i'm trying to do but i would say no no new skills required it's more a translation to somebody that understands the technology to help you do what you're already doing better yeah, correct maybe question to, to both of us i guess building off of that that's on the operator side as you think about on the technical side right on the it side one of the angles that i've seen one of the gaps that we've seen in, in capabilities user interface designers Right, someone that can actually, you know, to your point, who is a translator that can create now an interesting interface for the operator, right? There is a little bit of a lack of folks that can do that, but what I'm fascinated with the new tools that are coming, including the ones that you have, it makes it super simple to put those workflows in play, right? And so you're simplifying and eliminating the, 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 the getting the skills is not that 
difficult as it was five years ago because the tools that they have at their fingertips to design these things are much easier. I don't know if you if you would agree with that. Absolutely, or, yeah. agree. absolutely agree. I, so, I think is to to help make it easier for everyone. Sorry, go ahead, Abby. I was just going to say we're. I, I mean, the time has flown by here. We have time for one more short question and. <clears throat> There have actually been a couple of questions around how this gets developed, and is are these applications most likely get to, to be developed in-house or by an outsourcer or a third party? Greg, you want to? Sure, sure, happy to. Um, what we've seen is certainly organizations are capable of doing it themselves, but the DIY movement has also started to show it tends to be more expensive and it tends to take longer because that's not the company's core competency. And so trying to build, in essence, a software company inside a manufacturing company is expensive, challenging, and less productive than leveraging the expertise around you. And so organizations like BCG or PTC, engaging them so that they can help with the change management, they can help with the strategy, they can help with the execution, they can help with providing the software and the solutions that are already ready to go to be leveraged, to be able to go quickly and scale. That I think is where most organizations are headed. And that's the, um, that's the approach that the companies that are getting to the largest level of scale and the largest level of impact is utilizing. Certainly companies are doing it themselves and, and feel that there's some value to being proprietary or having something uh, unique in that way. It's challenging for tech support, it's challenging for integration, it's challenging to maintain long-term. And I think all of those aspects and more are leading to it being slightly longer, slightly more expensive, um, and therefore not as valuable in terms of getting to a full level scale and full level of impact. I don't know, do you, do you see anything differently, Bob? 100% agree. And I would say there has been a shift. If we look at those early adapters four or five years ago, they didn't have an option but to do it in-house, right? Buy a piece of hardware and then try to build something on top of it. Over the last five years, solutions have been developed right on the software side that just make it so much simpler to actually go and deploy. So now it's more around building capability in-house around business processes and identifying use cases and deploying it and driving the change management. But a lot of the you know software exists there and the developers that can quickly build around it from outside are accessible in the market, right? And one should build off of that. Great. Well, um, thank you both so much. Um, we are just about out of time. So uh, that, that was really interesting and informative. We, the slides will be available. So if we, I know I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. There were so many good questions. Uh, but thank you for uh, your attention in the audience and for providing those for us. Over the next couple of days, there will be a feedback survey that you'll receive via email. And we really appreciate your thoughts and opinions on how this went. Uh, as I said, a recording of the program will be available within three to four business days, and we'll let you know how to access that. We'll send a link to the recording as well as a PDF of the slides. And a final thank you to our sponsor, PTC. Uh, this is a really timely and important topic, and we appreciate your leadership in this area, uh, both of you, Vlad and Craig. And thank you so much. A pleasure. Happy. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks everyone for, for attending. Hopefully very helpful to guide everyone to thinking about their digital transformation and getting impact.